When we fear God and we serve Him, we have nothing to fear in this world. When we fear and trust in the Lord, He will lead us. Welcome to the Pax Christian Church Podcast. We are so glad you've joined us today. And we pray that this message speaks to you and encourages you and challenges you to live for Jesus with everything that you have. Stick around after the message. We'd love to find out how we can connect with you and be praying for you. Here's this week's message from our Sunday gathering. Uh, today we get to talk about um, something fun that uh, it's come up a bunch lately in, in a few different um, avenues, at least for me, for Mandy and I, as uh, we've been talking about ministry and talking about and, and praying through scripture and, and just engaging with other ministries, with other pastors and, um, and churches, um, uh, an identified issue in our world is a lack of fear of God or a lack of awe for the Lord. Um, that man, like if you... If you feared God, you might not do some of the things you do. I might not do some of the things I do. If I really believed that the God who created the universe really sent his son to die for me, if I have truly been put to death in baptism and raised to new life in Christ, I might not act the way I do at all times. I might be a little different in some of my conversations and some of the ways I spend my time and some of the ways that I even judge what I think God should be doing in my life. And when I hear, like, I, I, I do a lot of online engagement with people, and, but the thing is is that it, it often reflects, like I see the exact same thing reflected in the people I run into day to day, uh, whether it's uh, you know, in, in seeping in in conversations within the church and among people here or just out in the world, like, run into the exact same things. And so it's at, at this point, much of what's online, well, it's easy to get into toxic things, but when it, uh, and, and so I'm not saying everything online should, you know, kind of solely identify the way you see the world. Please don't do that. Um, but in engaging with the way people see and understand God, the thing about the online engagement there is that People do make videos and, and comments and things that represent how they feel about God. And there is so much flippant expectation about who God is and what he should do for us. And we'd rather have a pinball machine or, I mean, a, a, a slot machine Jesus that just like, if I hit the lever the right number of times in the right way, I'm going to get the jackpot and he's going to hook me up. Or if I, you know, I want the G Jesus in a bottle you know, and I just want to rub the lamp and have him pop out and be like, all right, Holy Spirit, activate, Holy Spirit, activate, activate, activate. And then like, now that I've said the right number of magic words, I can get whatever I want from God because he's my personal butler, you know, for in a cosmic life blessing sense. That's not how God works. You can read this thing front to back, sideways and forward and read it in Greek or Hebrew or Aramaic or Latin or whatever else, you will not find somebody going, Holy Spirit, activate, and then getting what they want. It's not in there even once. That's foolishness. And I mean, the way that, the way that we expect or even, you know, people so often, you know, that kind of wander away from the church after a time, or, or, you know, I used to go to church and now I don't really. And, and like, oh, how's that go? Well, you know, I just feel like, like, what has God ever done for me? <laughs> I mean, where should I start? Uh, you can breathe, right? <laughs> I mean, that's, you know, step one. Uh, your heart's still beating. I, I don't know. I mean, he created the universe. So, I mean, minor details. But yeah, yeah, you're right. I mean, he should have gotten to whatever random thing. And then what's amazing to me is how often that's followed up by the most selfish or even sinful activity afterward. I, I mean, I just can't shake the, the image of somebody who shared with me that they were upset that God never answers their prayers because they were praying for a better relationship with their abusive boyfriend that they were living with and doing drugs together and couldn't figure out like why as I'm living with my boyfriend, as I'm 
doing drugs with my boyfriend as we're raving and, and goofing off and playing around and doing everything just completely self-indulgently and doing everything I can to just like, how many sins can I check off in one you know, evening? And then going like, why doesn't God bless my relationship more? Why do we fight so much? You know, like I keep praying that, to God that my boyfriend will stop hitting me. But I won't do anything different. I'm not even willing to consider leaving him and or cleaning up anything in my life. And I'm like, I don't know why you're upset at a God who has given you some, some ways to live and some expectations and you're not even like attempting to like look in that direction occasionally. But you want God to show up and change your life. But all she wanted was God to bless all of the stuff she was doing and take away the one piece that she wasn't totally satisfied with and leave everything else. Leave me in the rest of my sin. I'm super happy with it. But I want you to take this one little part away. That's not how it works. And imagine the, the difference between like, well, I, I think we read about it in a couple weeks. We're not there today. But just like the idea of Moses standing in the desert and seeing like the top of a mountain, a light, and he hears something and it draws his attention as he's a shepherd out in the wilderness. And he goes and he, as he comes around and, and he finds a big tree that is on fire, but all the leaves are perfectly intact and all of the, all of the ground is undamaged. And there is this holy fire of the presence of God igniting and lighting up the night, burning the top of this mountain, but not consuming it in this completely insane supernatural moment. And Moses is just going like, what do I do with this? Uh, I mean, I don't think I should touch that. I don't think I should get close to it. And then the voice of God calling to him. And it even says like, take your shoes off. You've walked through sheep poop everywhere. You've walked in dirt and filth and, and stuff. Take your shoes off and come before me barefoot because this is holy ground. How dare you approach? But come. You have no right to be here, but I'm inviting you anyway. Who would walk into that situation and be like, <clears throat> okay, well, so now that I finally have your attention, I'd like to discuss how this went the other day. And <laughs> Delete. I mean, like, who would do that? Who would be that entitled? Like, most of our nation, I think. Most of us, most of the time, I think. Would be that just out of our minds, self-obsessed. And just missing, like, the holy fear of the one true and living God who created everything with a word. Who, who was and who is and who is to come, who has done all of these things to redeem us and, and heal us and fix us of these things. He didn't come to give us band-aids. He came to put us to death because our, our flesh is sinful and we indulge in it too much. And He came to give us new life. Now, I'm not, not in like a weirdo suicide cult way, like we're going to you know drink the Kool-Aid and fly off in spaceships or something nonsense like that. Like cults start with, you know, flippant wording like that. That's not it. It's about a death to self and a, and a new life fueled by the Holy Spirit, not by our own interests. Psalm 111 verse 10 says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All who follow His precepts have good understanding. To Him belongs eternal praise. If we follow the Lord in fear and holiness, we will make good choices. We will make better choices. Why? Because we will be following God. Follow His wisdom. Let Him speak wisdom into us. Like, I tried to encourage this girl. Like, there's nothing in God's will for you in all of these things, but especially in sitting in an abusive relationship. Like, can we help you get out of it? Oh, no, it's fine. He's not doing anything. Like, uh, cuts off communication. Doesn't want to deal with that. 
That's not the Lord's will. That's not the Lord's desire for you. That's not wisdom. Love is not pain-causing and suffering-inducing. Love is gentle and kind and patient. It, it's in 1 Corinthians 13. You can see what love is. And it's none of those things that lead to an abusive relationship. It's none of those things that lead to self-indulgent partying. It's, it's other-focused in a way that serves and elevates them and points them towards Jesus. It looks at broken and hurting people and goes, man, you are worthy of more than this, but even more... Even more, you shouldn't stay this way. You should be transformed by the presence of God. Let me point you toward him and bring you to him. And sometimes that can be a scary thing because so many people in this world don't, aren't interested in that. So many people in this world don't care. Some people are offended if you just mention Jesus. You can say whatever other crazy nonsense you want. You can, there's a whole unspoken rule on social media and just about everywhere else that we do not bash Muslims. Why? Because they will kill you. The extremists will murder you. The Christians? Nope. They won't. Easy target. It can be kind of scary to step out in faith, to, to speak of your faith. What if they mock me? What if they hate me? What if they actually persecute me? What if I'm arrested? What if I do this? Okay, what if you are? Jesus said, don't be afraid of those who can kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. God loves you more than you can possibly understand. But just like a good parent, God is not approving of every self-indulgent, stupid idea that you come up with. Because if you've been a parent or you've had a smaller sibling or maybe an older sibling like me, my little brother looked up to me for a while and went, oh, don't do that. If you've ever had a kid, the thing that comes to mind for me all the time and like, no, we have to step out in correction is I don't remember which one of my daughters. So it might be the one who's sitting in here. It might be the one who's serving in kids ministry. But when they were toddlers and just crawling around, they had these little like Tinkerbell wings that were like little, it was like a metal hanger, you know, like, I mean, they were fancy, you know, real Disney branded ones, but they were, um, but they were just like a little, you know, like elastic strap that had a little block in the back that four little clothes hangers with green tool plugged onto. And at some point they figured out how to pull them out and you had a few inches of just bare, you know, looked like copper metal sticking out the end of it. And they saw that and they saw the shape of the outlet in the wall and they were very determined to explore how that shape fits together. And I saw that very close to the, you know, we were getting right there and she's, you know, like scraping the wall trying to, you know, the aim wasn't there yet. And I'm like, no! And I run over and I grab up the kid. You can't do that! And I rip the thing out of her hand and I'm freaking out because I'm her dad and I know what happens if you make contact. You complete that circuit with your little tiny hand and like it's just going to be a bad day. You don't want that. The fit that was thrown for me removing that from her activity to-do list and then repeatedly going back, you can't do this. No, stay away from the plugs. And she was so upset. I mean, screaming like I had beat her. And I didn't. That's not okay. Don't beat your children. I didn't. But she screamed bloody murder just because I had pulled her away from electrocuting herself in the outlet. But what's our culture say? Love is love. God is love. Everything I want to do is fine as long as it makes me happy. That was going to make her happy in her mind. You know what else was going to make them happy? They love to try and chase the ball into the street. Well, you know, you should just let kids do it. They're, they're capable of making their own choices. Let the three-year-old make their own choice and chase the ball wherever they want. I don't want my children to find out how far a car can throw a baby. But that's what we get if we just walk away from any sort of correction, if we just go, you know, if I'm really going to love this person, I'm going to accept every insane thing they come up with. 
And none of us truly think that. None of absolutely zero rational people in our society actually fully believe that. Not a single one of them. They all have limits. The ironic thing is they're more than willing to tell you how you're wrong for telling other people they're wrong. Like the, the hypocrisy becomes immediately apparent as soon as they tell you you can't, you can't tell people they can't do that. But you just told people that they can't do things. Wait, <laughs> your math doesn't add up. No, there is right and wrong. There are things that we shouldn't do. There should be healthy boundaries in our lives. When we fear God and we serve him, we have nothing to fear in this world. When we fear and trust in the Lord, he will lead us in the right things. And even when it means standing against culture, even what it means as we're going to read about today, even when it means going against the laws of the land, which by default we should serve, we should follow, we should pray for our leaders, no matter how evil or stupid we think they are, whichever side of the aisle you land on, give it a couple more years, it'll be on the other side, and then you can hate that guy too, or whatever. At whoever, however you feel politically, however you feel relationally in this world, wherever you land on things, we should, we should pray for our leaders, we should follow the laws of the land to the best of our ability, up to the point of, if they conflict with God's law, if they conflict with how God calls us to live, God comes first, then everything else. It's like the, the commandment to honor your father and mother. But if you have an alcoholic, abusive father, you don't just do everything he says and say like, well, God gave me this wonderful, horrible human being to deal with, so I should just do my best to, you know, like turn the other cheek. No, that's not what it means. He's, he's violating God's law. You follow up to the point of honoring the laws of this world until if and when they conflict with God's way, God's way takes priority. Always. And no matter what it is we face, whether it's just relational persecution in the form of some sort of mockery or rejection or, or isolation because people won't deal with us because we won't agree with the common uh, ways of this world, or whether it looks like actually going against the government in some way, in some way that could threaten your freedom or threaten your life, still standing by God is the only way forward. And if we truly fear God, if we truly have an eternal perspective, then we find that when we fear God and serve him, we, we have nothing to fear in this world. Because what can they do to you? The end of what they can do to you is as you stand in this body. Beyond this is an eternity with Jesus that they can't touch. I'm not saying we want to try and like fast forward to that necessarily, but... There's a limited amount of injury you can inflict upon me because this isn't my final destination. This isn't where I stop. This isn't where you stop. Something else comes next. And the only thing that matters in what comes next is where you stand with Jesus. The only thing. And it's been that way from the beginning. This has been God's character from day one. We're going to read about Moses parents a little bit, but we're going to start in Hebrews 11 because that's where we've been and, and we're going to find our, our jumping off point there. In Hebrews 11 verse 23, it says, by faith, Moses' parents hid him for three months after he was born because they saw he was no ordinary child and they were not afraid of the king's edict. And if you had not read Exodus, you may not have any idea what's that, what that's talking about, but we're going to go back and check it out right now. We're going to go to Exodus 1. We've finished off recently talking about Joseph and, uh, and Jacob and, and Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and all of that, and then into Joseph's life and how Joseph has redeemed his family and given them an opportunity for everybody to come and live in Egypt. And it says he lived there for 17 years, or Jacob lived there for 17 years before he died, and, and uh, the whole family of Joseph was, uh, Joseph was there, all of his brothers and everything, and and at the end of Genesis, Joseph dies and is buried in a coffin. And so it, we start off with um, just a quick recap of who's there. Um, and, and then I want to hit verse 5 
to start with. Exodus 1, it's the second book of the Bible, if you haven't found it yet. Exodus 1, verse 5 says, the descendants of Jacob numbered 70 in all, and Joseph was already in Egypt. So the the number of people in Jacob's entire family is 70 people. Seven zero. That's not a ton. That's not a small number, but that's not like a whole nation. Abraham was promised that his descendants would become an entire nation. They're not there yet. They're starting off in Egypt. That's who showed up. It says, now Joseph and all his brothers and all that generation died. But the Israelites were exceedingly fruitful. The Israelites are the sons of ja- the descendants of Jacob. They multiplied greatly, increased in numbers, and became so numerous that the land was filled with them. So we get every generation, they're just multiplying like crazy. There's tons and tons of them after, you know, just a couple of generations down, they're, they're multiplying a lot. Then a new king to whom Joseph meant nothing. Because you remember, Joseph was the number two guy in Egypt, but he was not Egyptian. And so he was elevated to this place, but he was not left, uh, or uh, he didn't have any claim beyond like the Pharaoh's favor over him. And so as he's dead now, and now it goes a couple generations away, and a new Pharaoh takes power, he's like, yeah, I don't care about that Joseph guy. We've got all these foreigners in our land taking up our space, and he comes up with a new plan for what to do with all of the foreigners. He doesn't like them being part of it. He doesn't want them to be called Egyptians or anything like that. He doesn't want them to be part of their society in any equal way. He says, look, the Israelites have become far too numerous for us. Come, we must deal shrewdly with them, or they will become even more numerous. And if war breaks out, they're going to join our enemies, fight against us, and leave the country. Well, I mean, sure, self-fulfilling prophecy. Set them up to be your enemies and see if that works out. So they put slave masters over them to oppress them with forced labor. And they built, and they built Pithom and Ramses as store cities for Pharaoh. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread. So the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites and worked them ruthlessly. They made their lives bitter with harsh labor and brick and mortar and with all kinds of work in the fields. In all their harsh labor, the Egyptians worked them ruthlessly. And you read through that and you think, wow, I keep saying they're multiplying. Like, what's 70 times like a few? I don't know. Maybe that's not that many. But when you get to chapter 12, once you get down a few generations, when it's getting toward the end of Israel's time in Egypt, you find that the Bible's kind of underselling what it says when it says, like, God multiplied them and blessed them, and they were very fruitful. Like, they didn't just increase, like, 10 times. They didn't even just increase 100 times. After, when they're getting ready to leave, 430 years later, the Israelites, as they're beginning the Exodus, as they're beginning their time leaving, exiting uh, Egypt, In Exodus 12, verse 37, it says, The Israelites journeyed from Ramses to Succoth. There were about 600,000 men on foot, besides women and children. In American counting, the average family has like 1.5 to 2.5 children, something like that. I don't know if you have half a child, but... um, (laughs) That's, you know, the average number. So let's just say they got three kids each. They definitely had more than that. It, any family that had three kids, they were like, when are you guys going to start having kids? Like, there, there was a bunch. But let's just say, let, let's make it an even number. We'll just say for every one of them, for every man, it represents a family of five, his wife and then three kids, yeah? Probably that works out to a lot more than that. 600,000 times two is going to be 1.2 million times two, that, that's only a family of four, is going to be 2.4 million people. So easily more than 2 million people by that count. Because it's counting 600,000 men on foot. That, that's essentially speaking of able-bodied men who are of an age to marry and work and do those kinds of things. 600,000, more than 2 million, maybe 5, 6 million, without being crazy. That's a lot of people from 70. They filled the land. They filled the land. They did. Like a swarm of locusts. I mean, like, they just, they filled it. And that's, that freaked Pharaoh out. He's looking at all these people and he's like, 
I mean, uh, these people just like every time we turn around, there's another round of babies everywhere. Like these, these people just, they're crawling with humans all of a sudden. The king of Egypt, or the Pharaoh, same thing. The king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, whose names were Shifra and Pua, he said to the Hebrew midwives, so these are the people that are like kind of on behalf of it, but he's like going and, and checking, and he comes to them with this new plan, and this is the king's edict that we read about in a moment uh, in Hebrews. He says, when you are helping the Hebrew women during childbirth on the delivery stool, I don't know what that is, that's weird, um, but... Anyway, when you're helping them on, with childbirth on the delivery stool, if you see that a baby is a boy, kill it. But if it's a girl, let her live. The midwives, however, feared God and did not do what the king of Egypt had told them to do. They let the boys live. Then the king of Egypt summoned the midwives and asked them, why have you done this? Why are you letting the boys live? And the midwives answered Pharaoh, uh, Hebrew women are not like Egyptian women. They're vigorous and give birth before the midwives arrive. <laughs> like, I don't know. They just go out and they're like shucking wheat. And then they just like put the baby in the basket and keep going. Like it just, they don't even stop. We can't catch them. And by the time, like, they don't even address the possibility that he's like, yeah, yeah, great. Get him on day two. I don't care. Like, but they, they just come up with this kind of like, yeah, nope. I'm not going to do that. Why? Because this is God's blessing upon them. I'm not going to go against God to follow what this random king says. I don't care if you've got absolute power over our people. I'm not doing that thing. And I'm going to find some ways around it. I'm not going to do the thing. Now, that doesn't mean like, well, I think speeding tickets are dumb, so I'm going to find a way out. Like, no. That's not what that says. That's not what that means. But I'm not going to endorse or support something that is clearly evil and against God's ways just because the law of the land says that's the right thing or because people claim that the law should say that. I'm not going to go out of my way to pick a fight with the government and see what I can do to do it. But when, if they come to us, which is what the, the Hebrew midwives did not go, Hey, that Pharaoh guy, he is getting out of hand. Let's go kill him. They just said, wow, that was a messed up thing that he told us to do. Let's not do that. And then when he comes asking around about it, um, yeah, so that didn't work out. They had the babies before we got there. Sorry. And just like, mm, yeah, mm, I mean, you know, we, I mean, we totally would have tried, but, you know, it just keeps not happening. I don't know what happened to that. God was kind to the midwives, and the people increased and became even more numerous. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families of their own. God blesses them because they feared God above humans. When we fear God and serve him, we have nothing to fear in this world. Now, a man of the tribe of Levi. Now we're going to get into Moses' parents. Oh, exciting. Uh, if you're reading along in the Bible app on the notes, I apologize because for some reason I have the wrong translation in there. It's the CSB. Nothing wrong with it. It's a great translation, but it won't match what's on the screen so, or what I'm reading out loud. So um, you're welcome. <laughs> it's pretty close. Now, the tr a man of the tribe of Levi married a Levite woman. And she became pregnant and gave birth to a son. And when she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him for three months. That's like a weird, like, I don't know, he's too pretty to die. All right, we're going to keep him. I think every mom probably feels that way about her baby. But the implication is that they could tell there was something special in this child. The, the, the identifying kind of description there is just trying to point that like there's something right from the moment they saw him, they knew there was something special about this baby. And so they made sure not to do the thing. They hid him. When it gets to about three months, they can't manage it any longer. So when she could hide him no longer, she got up a papyrus basket for him and coated it with tar and pitch to waterproof it. And then she placed the child in it and put it among the reeds along the bank of the Nile. And his sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. Then Pharaoh's daughter went down to the Nile to bathe, and her attendants were walking along the riverbank. And she, the Pharaoh's daughter, saw the basket among the reeds and sent her female slave to go get it. And she opened it and saw the baby. He was crying and, 
And so she felt sorry for him. Pharaoh's daughter felt sorry for this child. She said, this is one of the Hebrew babies, she said. Then his sister walks up. She's been watching this whole thing, and then she walks up. And she says, shall I go and get one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby for you? Yeah, go do that, she says. So the girl went and got the baby's mother. She went and got her mom and said, Mom, I got a way for you to keep nursing my little brother. And she, she brings her. And Pharaoh's daughter says to her, Take this baby and nurse him for me, and I will pay you. <laughs> God's going to bless us as we follow him above the law of the land. They are like in absolute violation of the king's edict here. And yet, look at the blessing where he comes back around to her. When the child grew older, she took him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. And she named him Moses, saying, I drew him out of the water. The word for draw out of or or birth, you know, it's the same kind of thing, like pull somebody out of. Um, That that word is uh, Moshe, and uh, his name, Moshe, is um, essentially the same name. So she named him like born out of the river. Um, So, you know, river baby, whatever you want to. But this blessing of not only ensuring that this child survived, but that even when they couldn't manage hiding him anymore and they had to give him, they had to give him up, he's returned right back to them because they're doing all of this in trust of God. They're doing all this following God's way, not honoring the, the king. But again, they didn't immediately start a rebellion. Even when we read through all the plagues and everything, like they don't start a rebellion. They go, hey, you should let us go do this thing, please. And he's like, nah. And he's like, all right, well, that's going to be horrible for you. And he walks away, and then it's like frogs, flies, locusts, wasps, blood, boils, like all these horrible things. And he comes back and he's like, did you want me to like turn that off? <laughs> you know, like, because I'm still not really afraid of you. I'm, I'm, you know, like, when was the last time you made frogs? <laughs> and he's like, oh, we can find frogs. And they tried it, but like, it just didn't hold up, you know? Fear God and serve him and we will have nothing to fear in this world. Nothing at all. As we serve God, again, hopefully there's not a time where there's going to be a state mandate to end our children, although they had something very similar in China for a while. Now they're finding that their population's decreasing beyond what they can, they're okay with, and so now they're struggling to undo all of that. But even if it comes to something like that, it seems kind of obvious that we should stand against it. But what about things like, um, I just heard again uh, recently of somebody who um, had, you know, some students had shared a perspective of their faith in a classroom, and the teacher shot them down pretty hard. Does that mean those kids should never speak up about their faith anymore, or maybe that they should not acknowledge that they're Christians anymore because it's clearly causing some issue with them between them and the teacher and potentially I mean that could in affect grades and things because it's not a robotic thing the teacher uh, you know they, they have a little bit of a sway there and, and they could make life pretty difficult for a kid and the rest of the students could as well and you know the influence of a leader who's willing to, to pour into that so do they stand strong in following Jesus and responding when given the opportunity? Or do they, do they start a riot? Do they set the teacher's desk on fire? <laughs> I don't think you go that way. I don't think you go out of your way to cause mayhem and, and, and horror and damage. I think there, there's, a, there's a way in between the, the kind of you know, broad separation that we tend to look at in our world where you know, it's, it's extremes. It's either like go along absolutely without question or like violently resist. And then you have things in the middle, like Martin Luther King, that was like their, his big thing in the civil rights movement was like, do not go and fight back. We're gonna go sit in. We're gonna let them be the bad guys. We're not going to meet violence with violence. We're going to sit there 
peaceably and say, we absolutely as human beings have the right to coexist alongside you without hindrance. We should not be separated in these ways. And when they did, and, and he said this would happen, and it did happen, and they said, keep going anyway, stay peaceable. But when they, when they sat there and they were dragged out by the police and beaten with hoses and shot with, and, and shot with fire hoses, sometimes shot or lynched, he said, still, don't fight back. You only justify everything they claim about us. Let them be what they claim we are. But we follow Christ in this. We do this differently. Even though they kill us, let us follow Christ. Matthew 10. I, I quoted just one verse from this, but to bring things to a close, Jesus sends out his, uh, his 12 disciples, and he's going to do it again later. He sends out 72, and he gives a similar kind of uh, introduction to what's going to happen, to how it's going to go. But he says, I want you to go out among the Gentiles. I'm sending you out, <clears throat> and, and he gives instructions specifically for their journey. But then he says some things that carry with it a, 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 a way for us to engage in this world. He says, I'm sending you out like sheep among wolves. Therefore, be as shrewd as snakes and innocent as doves. Be both clever and, and crafty and, and wise about how you do things. Be, be aware of what you're doing and how you're doing it. Don't draw attention. Don't be the sheep that's going to walk over and kick a wolf in the mouth. Like, that's going to get you eaten real fast. Um, be as innocent as doves. Don't justify whatever persecution might come your way. Be innocent, especially in the eyes of the Lord. Be on your guard. You will be handed over to the local councils and be flogged in the synagogues. On my account, you will be brought before governors and kings as witnesses to them and to the Gentiles. But when they arrest you, don't worry about what to say or how to say it. At that time, you will be given what to say, for it will not be you speaking, but the spirit of your father speaking through you. Don't worry about what you're going to say. Don't be upset about, like, what am I going to do? What's going to happen right now? Just trust the Holy Spirit to speak through you. Trust God to show your righteousness, even if it results in your death, which, let's be honest, in America, like, that's not on the table at the moment. It might someday. And then, so what? For the early church, that was the thing. And especially, like, when we read the book of Acts, we cannot forget the fact that when you read the early church and they stand up and preach and they get arrested and, and whatnot and they have people coming at them and telling them, hey, you had better stop this. And the guy saying that has like a, you know, a, a little squad of guards with him. Those are the same guys that crucified Jesus. Like these are real threats coming from those guys. And then we read the church and it's like, how can I in a land that's probably not going to publicly execute me how can I stand with any less faith in the face of something that would tell me without just starting a revolution? There's zero governmental overthrows. There's no coups in Scripture, in the New Testament. They're not following Jesus into a riotous overthrowing of the government. They're standing faithfully and being like, okay, well, you decide, but as for me, I got to follow Jesus. I can't help but speak of what I've seen and heard, and I'm going to. I'm going to speak for God, for the redemption and healing available. I'm going to speak the truth. I'm going to say that a lot of the things that this world has come up with these days are insane. And I'm not going to go out of my way to dehumanize somebody. I don't want anybody to feel less than human, but man, I want them to know that God has a better plan for you than just following whatever crazy agenda the world has come up with today. And by better plan, I don't necessarily mean your life's going to get better. It might lead to more persecution. It didn't really work out well for the disciples. Exactly zero of the disciples got rich and famous and powerful. Exactly none. Out of the 12, one committed suicide. The other 11 were martyred, but John's didn't take. He lived through it. They boiled him in oil and then exiled him because he didn't die. And then he finally got back from that 
and pastored the church in Ephesus, according to the church history. That goes beyond the Bible's account of it. Every single one of the disciples, the other 10 plus Matthias, the guy that they bring in after Judas, So the other 11 apostles that were all martyred, plus a bunch more, like Stephen. Verse 21, he says, Brother will betray brother to death, and a father his child. Children will rebel against their parents and have them put to death. Children will turn their parents in and have them put to death. That happened in the Reformation. The Catholic Church would come to families and threaten children and and torture them, and they would give up their parents and say, okay, fine, here. And then they would put the parents to death and make the kids sign a confession. Uh, The uh, Russian, former Russian countries, and even during Soviet Russia, but uh, all throughout Eastern Europe, So many of those countries were so committed to an atheistic communist regime that they would do the same thing. They would turn kids against themselves, throw throw parents in prison and put the kids into indoctrination camps to train them up to be good atheist communists. Turn them against their parents. You'll be hated by everyone because of me. But the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. When you are persecuted in one place, flee to another. Truly, I tell you, you will not finish going through the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. The student is not above the teacher, nor a servant above his master. It is enough for students to be like their teachers and servants like their masters. If the head of the house has been called Beelzebub, how much more the members of his household? So do not be afraid of them. For there is nothing concealed that will not be disclosed, nothing hidden that will not be made known. What I tell you in the dark, speak it in the daylight. What is whispered in your ear when the Holy Spirit speaks to you, go ahead, just proclaim it from the rooftops. Do not be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground outside your father's care. And even the hairs of your head are all numbered. So don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. Whoever acknowledges me before others, I will also acknowledge before my father in heaven. But whoever disowns me before others, I will disown before my father in heaven. Serve Jesus. When we fear God and serve him, we have nothing to fear in this world. But if you reject him in favor of momentary comfort here in this world, it won't last. It will not last. It won't even last in this world. It won't get you what you want. There is no earthly peace that's going to truly satisfy your soul when you sit on your deathbed. There is no earthly peace that will satisfy your soul when you stand before Christ. Lord, let us be accepted by him because we have declared and supported and endorsed his way. This isn't your final destination. Be faithful to God first at all times. Don't be afraid of what will happen in this world. Jesus has you. And when this place is done, we go to him. So let us be like Paul, saying for me, To live is Christ and to die is gain. He's not looking to be executed, but he understands that that's on the table as he's in prison on death row, as he's being threatened with it and whipped illegally. And and he's going, hey guys, while I'm here, I get to talk about Jesus. And one of these days, if I keep doing it, they might end me. All right, cool, upgrade. And if they don't, great, I get to keep doing this. So either way, let me be for Christ. Let that be our call. Let each of us in every scenario be sent as missionaries. I mean, like to the gas station attendant, to the the grocery store clerk, to our coworkers, to our families. It might make Thanksgiving dinner awkward. 
But when it comes up and somebody asks where you stand on a thing, don't go out of your way to be like, hey, have you started repenting and following Jesus yet? I'm not eating until you all repent. Like, don't be that. But when people bring things up, don't shirk back and, no, no, I won't. Look, even if it costs me this relationship, I need you to know that God loves you. There are gentle and wonderful ways to do it that the only way for somebody to hate you on that is for them to be the bad guy. Be that person who speaks with such love and compassion for others with truth that Christ is magnified in everywhere you go. If we stand on Christ first, we have nothing to fear in this world. We're going to close in, in worship. I want to give you a moment just to reflect on is there anywhere in your life where God has not been elevated or prioritized? Is there anywhere in your life where the fear of repercussions, whether it's just relational conflict or, or awkwardness or, or just societal dissension, is there anywhere in your life where you are compromising your faith. And what would it look like to fear God above our fears of this world, whether it means not fitting in or whatever else that might mean? Because even to those who stood so many times throughout history, faced with the prospect of losing their very lives and freedom or turn their back on God, they stayed faithful and sacrificed life over freedom. Thanks for listening today. We hope this blessed you and that God spoke to you. We'd like to connect with you. You can find us at paxchristian.church and fill out the digital connect card. Or find us on social media as Pax Christian Church on YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram. If this message spoke to you today, would you consider sharing this message with someone? Maybe tell a neighbor or a friend. Maybe leave a review and let others know what this has done for you. May you be inspired and transformed by God's Spirit as you step out into this world to declare that there is peace with God for everybody through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.